Hello everybody, welcome back. My name is Moose Henderson. I'm a wildlife photographer. In our last video about composition, we covered six of the rules or guidelines in, in wildlife photography. And these guidelines included the rule of thirds, where you put a, a portion of the image on one of the cross lines. If you divide the image into thirds, and that makes a more pleasing composition. We also covered the concept of left to right, that here in America and most developed countries we read from the left to the right, so a lot of times in your image, if you'll organize things so that you look from left to right in the image, it will be a little bit more pleasing. We talked about isolating the subject and not having a bunch of distracting elements in the photograph. We talked about leaving negative space for simplicity. We talked about the rule of space, where if an animal is moving in the frame, you want enough room in front of the animal for the animal to move. Or if the bird is a you know, expanding its wings. You want enough room in the frame for the wings to expand without hitting the sides. And the last rule that we covered was the rule of foreground interest in depth. Now, none of these are really rules. They're more just guidelines. But uh, I didn't make up the terms, so we'll just go with the uh, rules and guidelines type thing. Today we're going to be going over six more rules or guidelines for composition in wildlife photography. And we'll do that in just a minute, right after this. Also mentioned during the first video that a lot of times some of these rules seem to contradict each other. Uh, you know, we say to shoot on the rule of thirds, but then today I'm going to give you my first guideline is the rule of symmetry and the rule of being centered. Now that of course completely contradicts the rule of thirds. Now I'm telling you to center your composition and to have symmetry on both sides. But this is generally a special case where you completely fill the image with like the face of a subject. And the symmetry is the left and right halves of, of the face. Or you completely fill the image with an animal coming directly towards you. And the left side of the image is one side of the animal. The right side of the image is the other side of the animal. And just the simplicity of this type of image can be very captivating, can really draw the viewer in, especially if you have like a face shot and the eyes and the nose and the mouth is a primary center of interest and it really draws the viewer's attention directly into the photograph that can almost see into the soul of the animal. And so that's the rule of centered and symmetry. The next guideline is to use patterns and textures. Now textures are pretty easy to use with animals because we've had the texture of feather, the texture of fur, and things like that. So use these textures and get them pin sharp in your image. And just the shadow detail between the various hairs will give your photograph 
so much crispness, crisp, crispness, hard to say, so much crispness and texture. Now, one of the ways to make sure that you get a little bit of texture is do not shoot with the sun directly behind your back. My photographic mentor, Charles Glatzer, has a saying where light illuminates and shadow defines. Well, what that means is if you get the light a little bit off center from directly behind you, it's going to be coming at a slight angle, say anywhere from 5 to 10 degrees. And by hitting the animal at a slight angle, there's going to be shadows in between the individual feathers. There's going to be shadows in between the individual hairs. And those shadows will help to define each individual hair. If you've ever taken a passport photo and looked at it in your passport, it is about as bland as you can possibly imagine. And that's because the light is coming from directly over the camera or directly adjacent to the camera. And so all of your features are flattened out and you have no rounding to the face and your, your hair has no texture to it. So if you get the sun just a little bit off angle from behind you, you'll come up with much better textures. Now patterns, that's a little bit harder in wildlife photography. It's much easier in landscape photography where you're getting like the patterns of an open field in the Palouse or uh, aerial photography where you get patterns of fields, geometric patterns and stuff like that. You are able to get some patterns in wildlife photography. You can get the patterns of the trees going up and making various shapes. You can get the patterns of the mountains behind an animal and form an animal scape. So patterns are important and are something that you should use. So patterns and textures is the second guideline for today. The third guideline is to fill the frame. Now, of course, this goes against the one that we talked about during the first one where we said leave negative space. But you kind of use each of these rules and guidelines for each individual photograph. So if you're taking an image that concentrates on symmetry, and centered of the image, like say a portrait shot, then you do want to fill the frame with nothing but the face. You don't need a lot of extraneous details on the sides or a lot of negative space on the sides because your center of interest is just that face shot. So occasionally filling the frame can really yield a dynamic image. Number four, is simplicity and minimalism. Don't include a lot of things in your photograph that are not ne ne needed. If you're doing a centered and symmetrical type image of the face, there's no need to have part of the feet in the image or something like that. Just keep it where it's super simple and super minimal. Now that's easy to do like in a landscape photography thing where you've got some rolling hills and one single tree stuck out in the middle or maybe you have a seascape and one rock where the sea is running over the thing. Well you can do the same thing in wildlife photography where you have one animal out in an open field and you leave a lot of space around him and the eye immediately goes to that one animal because the image is so simple. You use the sun angle and the lighting and things like that to really light up this angle. Maybe you even get a sunbeam going down that points to the animal or a trail that goes in and runs to the animal or something like that. So simplicity and minimalism can really add some dynamic punch to your photographs. Number five, use particular color combinations. 
Now you've all seen the color wheel that they have in art class where you've got red, green, and blue, and then you've got yellow, magenta, and so on. And directly across from each of these are said to be complementary colors. So if you combine like a golden yellow with a little bit of reds or something like that, it comes out to be very pleasing. And so include these color combinations in your photograph. For instance, you can have a nice red sunrise or sunset behind an animal that is dark. And so the contrast of the dark animal and the bright red sky behind it or the muted sunrise behind it really gives you some dynamic interest by having those color combinations. There's also some rules of color that says that red seems to come forward and blue tends to go backwards and stuff like that. So learning these particular guidelines of artistic expression can really help you add depth to your photographs by using color and various color combinations. And the sixth rule for today is use implied motion in your photographs. Uh, with birds, if you have the wings going up, that's an implied motion. We know that the wings are going to go up. If you have an animal, have one of the paws up as if he's taking a step. I generally like to have the, the farthest front paw up off the ground and kind of crooked like this because that leads your eye into the animal and you feel like the animal is moving. If you have an animal that's laying on the ground, say you have a bison, and you know, what is exciting about a bison laying on the ground? Well, if the bison is flicking his tail and you catch a photograph with the tail in midair, then it, it, it looks like the bison is alive. It's dynamic. It gives the image a lot of punch and a lot of movement and it engages the viewer into your image. So try to use movement in your photographs. I photograph bison coming over the top of a hill and when they come over the top of the hill they tend to run down the hill very quickly. And so you get a lot of implied motion just by them moving downwards and having their feet moving. I've taken photographs of moose and they have their paws up. Photographs of pronghorn, photographs of birds. For instance, if you do a shorebird on the beach and you just take a picture of the bird sitting on the beach, then it looks like a blob sitting on the beach. But if you wait for the bird to do a wing stretch and get his wings way up over his head, then you've got that dynamic feel to the image. And it really brings the image alive. So don't forget to use movement as part of your images. Okay, so that's the six guidelines that we have today. Number one was centered and symmetry. Number two is patterns and textures. Number three is to fill the frame. Number four is simplicity and minimalism. Number five is color combinations. And number six is movement. Well, that's it, folks. That covers the second part of composition. We'll have a third part coming up in a week or so. You guys like this cup? One of my clients brought this to me just the other day. Is just the other day. It uh, has an image of the cover of my book on it. A really beautiful gift, and I was speechless, which is a bit unusual for me to be speechless. Uh, but yeah, well, one of my clients gave it to me. So I thank you guys for joining us today. If you've enjoyed this video, please hit the like icon. Consider subscribing to our channel for a lot more content. We upload a video at least once a week. 
sometimes multiple times a week. I thank you so much for following our channel, and we will see you again next time. Goodbye.